right, get out your Bibles, open up to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to, uh, we are, we're jumping headfirst into the deep end of the pool this morning. We are going to uh, uh, take the first step, actually it's the second step, if you were here last week, we, we started our journey into this message series simply entitled Just Ten, this message series through the, through the, um, to the Ten Commandments. Last week we looked at uh, what I believe is the literally is the foundation for all of God's law, all of really not just the law, but really the gospel. And I want, I want, to, I want, to, I want to check, I want to check with you this morning. I want you to check in with, with me. I want to hold each other accountable. We came away last week saying that, that all the law hung on, on the great commandments, on the great commandments. And we, and we as a church, we want to be infusing this into our DNA. We don't want to just be talking about the great commandments. We want to be living these things out. So um, we kind of we've kind of abbreviated and and done our own thing here with the great commandments. So we said it this way: We want to be a people. We want to be a people. We want to be a people that loves God supremely and loves others sacrificially. That is the great commandment. That that sums up everything. Last week we kind of. We kind, of, we, we kind of took it away from this, and that if we will live that way, literally the battle against sin would be won. Because if we're loving God supremely, and we're loving others sacrificially, we're never going to sin because, I don't know about you, but like 100%, maybe it's 110% of my sin is because I'm selfish. That's just, I, that may not be true for you. you. You may sin sacrificially, I don't do that. When I jump in head first into being disobedient to God, it is all about me in that moment. It's all about me. And, and so the, the, really the, the battle that we wage to put our sin to death, Colossians 3, is one on the battleground if we will love God supremely, love others sacrificially. And Jesus said in, in Matthew's gospel that on, on those things hang or hinge the entire law. So I wanted that to be the start because if we just jump into Exodus 20, all we get is moralism. And I will tell you, I don't know that there's been a greater cancer in the church for probably its whole life than moralism. If I'm good enough, if I'm just good enough, if I can just, if I can just do this and don't do this, then I'm okay. God will be okay with me, I'll be okay with him because, well, because I'm, I'm doing what he said. I had an opportunity. I'm, I have less hair on my head this morning, and that's, and that's two reasons. One, I got a haircut. Two, more has fallen out. That's just going to be the, the reality every single day, right? But I had an opportunity to, um, to get my hair cut yesterday, and, and I, was, I was speaking to the individual who was, who was cutting my hair, and, 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 and she was sharing with me. Her name is Kristen. We need to be praying for Kristen this morning. Um, she, she shared with me you know, that, that you know, I, I, I said, you know, she said, what are you doing tomorrow for Mother's Day? And I said, well, I have an incredible Mother's Day plan for my wife. We're going to be in church on Sunday morning. We're going to be in church on morning, and then we're going to come back Sunday night, because that's, that's what we do. That's what we do for Mother's Day. Um, and, and I said, well, she, and she shared with me her faith journey, at least a little bit, and, and, and she asked me what I was preaching, and I said, well, we're moving through a series in the Ten Commandments, and, and, and she said, she said that, you know, that's, that's incredible. It was awesome, and, and I said, well, tell me what you think about that, and she said, well, I, I know you know, she, she shared with me one of her struggles, and one of her struggles was that she has issues with some language, so some things pop out of mouth that, that shouldn't, right? I'm sure there's nobody here in this, in this place that struggles with that at all, right? And because we know, you know what God's Word says, it says, let no foul or crude thing come out of our mouths, and we want to be living that out, because we just sang to Jesus, right? So why would we do that with the same mouth that we, you know, so I mean, so that's, that's, a, that's a real deal, and, and she said, well, I know I need to stop doing that. And I know if I stop doing that, I know, I know I'll probably be okay. And I just sat there going, that's low and outside. That's when we swing and we just hit. And I, and I said, I said, Kristen, let me just share with you. Um, there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Um, and, and I said, frankly, sweetie, it's not what you do or don't do that earns you favor with God. It's what he did for you that brings you into favor with him. And she looked at me, and the conversation took a turn, because I don't think it wasn't going to go anywhere. But I want to be praying for her. I encourage you, name is Christy or Kristen. We need to be praying for her. Um, and uh, after all of that, that, was early in the haircut. I still came away. I think I'm looking okay. So we're, so, so, so we're good. Um, 
but, but here's the thing. Sometimes we get, we get those, those, those opportunities. I want to make sure we're, we're clear one more time about this. You can live the Ten Commandments and go straight to hell. You can be obedient to it all and live an eternity separated from God because it's not how good you are. Because even if you could, you're still not good enough. It is because of the goodness and the grace of God. And what we're going to do is we're going to be making some strong connections this morning about God's law and God's grace. The two are not separate from one another. They are together. They work together. They work together. Okay, but we're going we're to be setting some priorities. And really, the first commandment, if we don't get this one right, the other nine, we're, we're going we're gonna to miss and we're going to mess up. So I'm going to be really intentional. Okay, so Exodus chapter 20. Everybody got their Bibles open? Exodus 20. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3. So this is going to be a really, because sh- I mean, I can't, certainly, I mean, I can't go super long on three verses, right? Certainly. Can't, can't, can't do that. Um, yeah, that's, see, I just broke the ninth commandment. Okay. Um, bearing false witness. Okay. Um, and by the way, Sunday night, you're going to, I know it's Mother's Day, um, and, and I don't know, I just, we're going we're gonna to do some Ten Commandments work tonight, because I want everybody to know when we're done with this series, I want you to know the Ten Commandments in order, not so that you can just say I know them, but so that you can teach them to your children, because that's what God wants, okay? So let's stand together in honor of reading God's Word this morning. Exodus 20, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3, and um, we're just going to dig into this very first commandment, okay? Beginning in verse 1, and God spoke all these words saying, stop, look at me, every Easter, Charlton Heston pops up on the screen, C to B to Mills, Ten Commandments, okay? It's a great movie. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. God, you know, the finger, writing, and all this kind of stuff, God spoke these things to his people there at the foot of the mountain, and God is talking to them. In fact, biblically, this is the, one of the only times you'll ever see this in all of biblical history. Until you get to Revelation, God's speaking to his assembled people all at once. This is a historically significant moment. I wanted you to have that in mind, okay? Verse 2, I am, ring a bell? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Father, in these next few moments, uh, Lord, I pray that we would, um, we would do uh, good business today. God, I pray that you would illuminate the truth, God, of these three verses. And God, we would not just see this as a story, a Bible story in the Old Testament, but God, we would uh, very, very easily, and God, just very simply, realize, recognize, God, that even as you delivered the Israelites from Egypt out of slavery, you have delivered every Christ follower in this room out of the bondage of slavery and sin and selfishness, and God, you have brought us into relationship with you. So God, I pray, as the Israelites heard that day, these incredible words, God, that you would speak to our hearts. God, hide me behind the cross. God, let this not be about Peter, but God, let it be about Jesus, and in Jesus alone, we pray this morning. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Um, I know most of you, hopefully most of you, got a, a listener guide this morning. If you didn't, uh, you can steal the person's next to you. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. That would be wrong. Stealing is wrong all the time. Um, you can grab something to write on. Um, um, ask somebody for a piece of paper or something. Just, just take, take some good notes. Um, here's the thing. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to do something a little out of the ordinary. Everybody, keep your fingers in the Bibles, but close them. Close your Bibles. Close them. Um, uh, we, we cannot look at this text by itself. We cannot do it. Um, if we, like I said, if we just look at the law, we run the risk of, of just becoming moralistic. And moralistic will lead us to nothing but destruction. We have to grab the context in which these commandments are given. So let's, let's just kind of unpack this a little bit. Um, Exodus, the book of Exodus, um, is a part of a grander story. Uh, some of you who grew up in church, you might, you might know this. The first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five, tuk meaning books. Um, a, lot of, a lot of scholars will say this is one, the Exodus would be, uh, this is one part of five, okay? Um, others you'll hear the first five books referred to as the Torah. Torah meaning a word that says order or law. 
Okay, so that's the context. Now, so we don't want to jump in the middle and just start there. We want, to, we want to grab the context. So we have to dial this all the way back to the book of Genesis. And I want to start by saying, we, you know, most of us, many of us know the story of Adam and Eve, our first parents, and, and God created them and God set them up perfectly. He loved them, bestowed upon them incredible blessing, set them up in the garden and established a covenant with them saying, you can live here, you can enjoy my blessing, enjoy my presence so long as you don't eat that and there was a tree that they were told they could not eat of they can eat of everything else but one thing and just like you and I just like good kids everywhere and I don't care if you're a kid of the age of eight or if you're if you're the a child of the age of 80 we're all children and we're gonna we're gonna latch onto the one thing wait you told me I couldn't do that well that's what I'm gonna do so they did and man fell and God said get out and there was separation between man and God from that moment forward the greatest cosmic, cosmic acts of treason was committed that day. Treason. And treason is a crime that is usually punishable by death. And they, and they died that day. Their relationship with God ended and physical death entered the realm of, of, of creation and all of creation suffers now as a result. You read your Bibles, it'll say all of creation groans. It's not just humanity that's affected by, by sin. It's everything. It's everything. So we, we move forward, and God there begins to make some promises and establish what he's going to do. And, of course, um, he, we, we have Noah and we, the, the, the amazing catastrophic events that happened there. God's full wrath and judgment poured out on the world. You fast forward from there. We arrive, I think it's Genesis chapter 12. You'll, you'll be introduced to a man by the name of Abram who would eventually uh, marry, a, who was married to Sarai. Their names would ultimately be changed because that's what God does. He changes identity. That usually means there's going to be a name change. Um, so we go from Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. And from there, God gives a promise. And by the way, God says, leave your family, leave it all. And, and, and just making your way, just get out and, and just start making. So there was a covenant promise there. And the promise was that, that God would pour out his favor on them. And from them would an incredible, unable to be counted number, a nation would come from them. And, and, they, and, and it would just be a blessing. And, and literally, many of us, some of us grew up in, in church and you went to VBS. How many of you remember singing Father Abraham? Okay, hands across the sky. Okay, good. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons. I'm not going to sing it. It's awkward. And don't make the motions because that's wrong. Um, at least not till later. And then we can do that later. Um, okay, so Abraham, we have the promised child. We have Isaac. That's the one that God promised. Abraham and Isaac had to wait a long time time for, for Isaac come and Sarah had a child and it was just incredibly awkward because they were really old okay and by the way let me just talk to the senior saints a minute don't knock being old God can still do incredible things through you for you that will bless others that's their story okay so Abraham to Isaac there's a there's a reconfirmation of the promise that God's going to do something incredible in them and through them through their descendants Isaac we get to Jacob okay we have the families growing we have family moving I don't want to spend a lot of time Jacob has a whole bunch of kids, lots of sons, one in particular. His name was Joseph. Now, Joseph was a knucklehead, and I mean that in the deepest theological sense possible. He, 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 he's arrogant. He's prideful. He, he knows he's his daddy's favorite, and by the way, daddy has affirmed that that's my favorite, and when that happens, brothers are going to be brothers. So what do the brothers do? They organize, they coordinate, and they, they, they hit boy, they hit Joseph over the head, throw him in a pit, sell him off, and, and they rip up the, 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 the coat that he's wearing, and they put blood on it, and they go back to Jacob and saying, sorry, your son's dead. But he wasn't dead. They, they sold him into slavery, and Joseph ends up in, in the incredible superpower nation of Egypt, and through an incredible series of invent, events, which uh, he, he's a slave, and, and then he's in, he's in prison, and just the whole back and forth of that story, through the circumstances and God's favor on his life, Joseph lands the number two spot in this superpower country. And, and God gives him a vision. There is going to be, there, there's going to be, there's going to be a, a time of plenty. There's going to be a time of famine. Your job is to get Egypt ready for the famine. So, 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 so Pharaoh assigns Joseph the job, and off they go. And we arrive at that time where Joseph is now 
serving, ministering in this role, and famine comes, and Egypt is ready. And they become literally the breadbasket for every other nation and people around them. And that was God's plan. Because at some point, the brothers come to Egypt. And they didn't know it, but they ended up having an audience with the brother that they sold into slavery. And through a series of events, Joseph revealed himself. There was forgiveness. There was restoration. And ultimately, the series of back and forth, Jacob moves the entire clan, the whole family, to Egypt. And there we have, we have the, the establishment of this coexistence of God's people and the nation of Egypt. And there was, for a while, for a time, there was, there was great blessing. But whenever there's a change in leadership, a change in management, sometimes things will change, right? Well, the benevolent Pharaoh who was in charge, who kind of got the ball rolling, well, he stopped being Pharaoh. There's another Pharaoh, and the whole game changed. And literally for 400 and th- 430 years, about, a, about four and a half centuries, Israel is no longer favored partner or neighbor to Egypt. Now they are functioning as slaves. And they are at work building the cities and the monuments and the, and the incredible things that ancient Egypt was, is kind of known for. And after four and a half centuries of this, um, they get to a point where they've had enough. And they cry out to God. And God, in his timing, raises up a man by the name of Moses. Moses. Y'all know that name? Um, Moses is born in Egypt um, under threat of death. Mom kind of worked in a finagled way where, where boy would ultimately be, be raised um, in, a, in, in a healthy, safe environment, and mom would still be connected and attached to his, to his upbringing. And Moses uh, obviously had a man who had issues because he lost it one day, and he killed an Egyptian taskmaster. So he's a murderer. He's a murderer. And he flees Egypt, and he, he goes far away, and it was there as he's, he connects with a man named Jethro, gets married. There's a, whole, there's a whole family that's established there, and Moses steps away from being royalty in Egypt, and he land, lands a shepherd job. And while he's shepherding, um, well, there's a bush, and it's on fire, but it's not burning. But it's on, and by the way, if you can wrap your mind, it's on fire, but it's not burning. Okay, good. God says, okay, the whole purpose of your life, I'm going to send you back to Egypt, and you are going to be my voice, my spokesman. You are going to be the catalyst by which the, my people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would be set free. And of course, if you know the story, I don't want to go into a whole big detail, Moses is like, nah, I can't talk, I've got a speech impediment, I'm a murderer, I've got a record, I've got all kinds of issues working against me here, and God just kind of says, yeah, I love you, shut up and just do what I tell you to do. I'll even let you bring some help. Here's Aaron, you just, you just guys go make it happen, Okay. And of course, we, we, he, he, go, he obeys, he goes back, he gains audience with Pharaoh, and there is a conversation, there is a dialogue, a back and forth. And of course, we have, you know, let my people go. No, I'm not going to let the people go. So there's plagues. And ultimately, um, there's, we, we get to the 10th one, which is awful, um, and which God says, I'm going to, we're going we're gonna to get you out of here. And the, the word to Pharaoh through Moses is, okay, you don't let the people go. God is going to pass over Egypt, and he's going to kill every firstborn thing in one foul swoop. And Pharaoh said, nah. And God gave the the, the people who were obedient to him, gave them a plan and a promise where they could be protected. And of course, we call that, we call that, that specific event, we call it Passover, where God passed over. Egypt, and can you imagine in one night as God passes over this nation, the weeping and the crying and the tragedy of all of this as it, as it comes about? Well, Pharaoh finally said, okay, uncle, I've had enough. And he lets the people go. And of course, he doesn't really let them go. He starts chasing after them, and then there's, the, there's water, and then there's no more Egyptian army. All that gets wiped out. But God eventually leads the people back to the foot of Mount Sinai. Under his protection, under his leadership, he brings them back to this place. And it is here that this incredible presentation begins. And I want to I invite you to, okay, go ahead and reopen. Your, you go, we, we got a context, right? 
if we, if we, if we have a context, now we have, we have a place to, to jump off from. So here we have a bunch of folks. Um, they've been in slavery for 430 years. Now um, they, they and, but here's the thing. God has set them free. They're free, from, they're free out of bondage of slavery, right? But they're, they've been set free, but they're not living free. Why? Well, all we have to do is look at the commandments. They're, they're, they're still they're in their minds and their hearts. They're still living like slaves. They're, they're committing adultery. They're stealing. They're coveting. They're lying. They're not raising their children in, in the Lord. They're, they're worshiping false gods in addition to the real God who has set them free. So they're making a choice. Though they have been set free, they're not living free. And this is why God is going to speak to them. It's not out of anger. It's not out of judgment. It's this is God out of his love and his grace and his patience and his mercy. By the way, just as he was with Pharaoh, just as God was merciful and patient with Pharaoh, he is going to be patient and loving and gracious towards these people. And that's what brings us to these Ten Commandments. So we look at these first three verses. And the, just the, the, these things that I want to run through quickly this morning. Uh, God is the one who speaks into the hearts of his children. We're just taking that right there from verse 1. And God spoke all these words. Again, why did, why did we just recap history? Well, again, if we just look at the, if we just look at the law, then, then there, there, there's a better than good chance we're going to end up like Catholics and Jews and Muslims and even Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. We end up seeing the commandments from the wrong perspective. We see it from a perspective of, don't do this, do this. If I do this, if I, if I do the things that God doesn't want me to do, God's going to get angry and punish me. If I do the things that God wants me to do, he'll love me and bless me. Um, I don't care how many religions propagate that philosophy, it's wrong. It's not biblical. That's not why God gave us the Ten Commandments. And I, I, I'm burdened and heartbroken over, over how many Christians, how many generations of believers look at the Ten Commandments and, and have fashioned the Christian life thinking that way. What an incredible burden. If, you, if you're one of those folks, what an incredible burden you must be living under. It's no wonder that people don't have the joy of salvation because you're so busy dotting I's and crossing T's. That's why establishing a context is so vital. The Ten Commandments are given in a context where God has already loved. He's already served and saved. He's already set free. God has already adopted these kids into his family. They got the job. He's not saying this is how you keep the job. He's saying you've got the job. You're my kids. I'm your dad. Here are the rules. Rules given outside the context of love are a burden. L rules given in the context of love with the right desire, with the right outcome, with the right heart behind them. This is why Jesus says God's, God's law is not burdensome. It's not. We've already been loved. It's not that we, we do this to be loved. It's that we, we already have been loved. That's incredible. This isn't about obeying God so that he'll love you. It's about him passionately loving you and setting you free and helping you to obey him. So we can't ignore everything that comes before Exodus 20 and then launch into the morality of, the, of Exodus 20. We have, to, we have to grab the context. So God speaks to his people, and here's what he has to say. First, he tells them that he is a God who loves to set free. Exodus 20, verse 1, And God spoke all these things, saying, Okay, first thing, who speaks? Who's, who's talking? It's not Moses. It's not Aaron. Who's speaking? It's God. God is speaking. So, so, let's, so let's bring this forward. Um, here, here, here God is, here God is, is speaking um, to, to his nation, to his people, to those that he loves, and he's saying, listen to me, follow me, I love you. Here's the context, and here's the thing. Is God still speaking? Is God still speaking? The question I have is, are we listening? We want to, we want to be really intentional about this because I, I believe that, that as, as evangelicals, when we, when we hold up the Bible, when we look at what this is, this is what we believe. What God says, the Bible says. What the Bible says, God says. 
we need to know this, that when, here's the thing, and I want you to be intentional about this in the coming, coming days as you sit down and you, and you open the Bible, I want you to know that God is speaking to you. It's not an us thing, it's a you thing. God is speaking to you. Well, pastor, he wrote this book for, for everybody. Isn't this for everybody? Um, actually, no, it's for his kids. This is for his people. Just as much as the words that he shared on the mountainside was for the nation of Israel, it's for us. When we open the Bible, we, we're hearing from him, and we don't believe that those things are alongside philosophy or religion or weird spirituality or, or ideology. This book, this word is not speculation about God. This is revelation from God. God is not, he's not concerned or interested in your opinion of him. He doesn't live or need your affirmation or encouragement. That's not who we are. It's not our job. God survives and, and thrives and he is all that he is all by himself. He doesn't need us. We need him. The Israelites needed the law. They were, they were set free, but they weren't living free. And I want to make sure that, that we understand as a church that, that God's word, this is our bedrock. This is our supreme court. It's who we are. It's what we believe. It's what we live by. This is our final authority for all matters of life. Some of you are living, walking in a spiritual desert right now. Some of you are. Some of you aren't, but some of you are. What is a desert? Desert is an extreme dry place. It is hazardous to be. There's no water. You are struggling to take every step forward. And here's the thing. God is always speaking. But you may not, have you not, you may not be hearing from him. Maybe you haven't heard from him in a long, a long time. Let me, let me say something you may already know, but you need to be reminded of. Not only is God always speaking, but he, he wants to talk to you. He wants the conversation. He wants it more than you do. How do we know that? Well, we know that because he's always speaking. We're fickle. I'll go to God when I need him. I'll put my quarter in and pull the one-armed bandit and hope I get what I need. That's oftentimes how we, how we treat God. God, I'll check in when I need you, but otherwise, when, when I'm good, I'll see you later. And we wonder why we land in the spiritual desert that we're in. We wonder why we struggle at times. Friends, this is not an old book. This is a timeless book. And because it's timeless, it's always timely. So we need to be checking in often, consuming voracious amounts of the living water that is the word of God, because God is always speaking. Now, here's the thing. If you fast forward through Exodus 20, uh, and you get to the end of the end of the chapter, at least to the end of the section, um, if you go to Go to verse 18, it says this. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashings of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Um, I know the Bible talks about God speaking to us in a still small voice. And I know for some of us in seasons of life, that's exactly how God speaks. Please don't put God in a box. When God speaks, when God speaks into your life, even if it's that still small voice, I think that's the right response. I think that's the right response. That they would hear the voice of God, they would see him in his presence for all that he is, and their response is to tremble and to fear. And if you know Isaiah's story in Isaiah chapter 6, the story there is he immediately came to the place where he's in the presence of God, where he's immediately aware of his sin. Well, what do you think is driving them to fear? the very same thing. As a sinful people, when we come into the presence of God, or maybe better said, when God comes into our presence, one of the things that we need to hold in that reverential awe is being in the presence of God is always going to bring me to a place where I am becoming intensely aware of those things in my life that keep me separated from Him. So God is the one who speaks to the hearts of His children, but God is also the one who sets His children free from the chains of slavery. Go back to verse 2. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. So now we have the nation, a few million former slaves that are set free, um, but they're not living free. Again, they're, 
they're in essence, they're living in contrary to exactly what, what, what God had been desiring from them. They're committing adultery, they're stealing, they're coveting, they're lying. Again, they're not doing what they need to do with their kids. They're worshiping false gods. All of living in that culture in Egypt has brought them to a place where they've lost their way. And God sets them free, but they don't know how to live free. So God in this moment is going to speak to them. So what's really amazing is how God begins. He starts with, I am the Lord your God. A couple things that jump out just at me about that. Number one is that declaration is incredibly personal. I am your God. What I love about that is he's not asking. Can I be your God, please? Pretty, 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 please, 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 please. Some of you, some of you, and your, whether you recognize this, in your theology, you've made God a beggar. As if God is begging for you in your life. God does not beg. He declares, I am your God. That's how God works. That's how he's always worked. That's how he works today. It's not about you inviting him into your life. It's about him inviting you into his life and us saying yes to that. This is what God is doing. He's saying, I, I'm your God. I'm your God. I am the Lord. I am the one and only God. I am relating myself personally to you. I want to have relationship with you. And as God reintroduces himself to his people, and by the way, I want you to catch this. Um, Israel, they, they've been in Egypt for 430 years, and right here in this moment, God is reintroducing himself. Now, I want you to see something. In the plagues, the pri- we would say, argue, the primary purpose of the plagues was to get Pharaoh uh, to, to let the people go, and I would say that was 50% of it. The other half of it was God was revealing himself to his people one more time. God had been silent, literally, for 430 years. They need some reminding. So how did God remind them? What is God ultimately to us and to them? He's creator. He has power and authority over creation. Look at the plagues. How do they start? They start with water. What's the first thing God created? Well, there's light and there's water. So when you move on through the plagues, you can track through the process of creation. What's the last thing God created? Life, human life. What's the, what's the last thing? What's the final plague, the 10th plague? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take life. That was it. God's reintroducing himself to his people. And all of that, he is creator. And as God reintroduces himself, he's saying, as he brings it back to the mountain, it's in essence saying, hey, hey, hi, I'm God. Uh, remember me. I created everything. By the way, let me, let me show you. So as they get to that place, he reintroduces himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because of who God is, because of his holiness, because of, of God's nature and character, God is not going to tolerate the way his people are living because his people represent him. So he's going to put a stop to it. Not only is, I think, the declaration, I am the Lord your God, it's not just personal, it's also a declaration of supreme authority. What is he saying? I am the Lord your God. What's he saying? I'm your boss. I get to tell you what to do. This is incredible. Again, do you see anything about God asking permission to do anything here? Please let me lead you. Please follow me. No, I'm the Lord your God. I'm declaring myself to be the supreme authority. They, in in slavery, they were in bondage under one. They heard and, and, and maybe even some received Pharaoh. Pharaoh to the Egyptians was a god. So God delivers them from someone they knew and understood had been taught was a God. It takes about 400 years to indoctrinate a people, right? So they've been indoctrinated. They've been worshiping lots of gods. And the, and the worship of gods is if I do just enough, the God will bless me, we'll have fertility, we'll have, we'll have harvest, we'll have all of this stuff, right? We'll have kids, you know, God will bless, the gods will bless. And so God is rearranging. He is, he's deprogramming and reprogramming in a single statement. He's saying, I am the Lord your God. I am your authority. I whooped up on Pharaoh. I proved how a lame of a God he was. He was lame. He, and all that I did, Pharaoh couldn't, couldn't match it, couldn't, couldn't do it. I am your God, not them. I delivered you from slavery. I love you. I've protected you. I've created you. He is God. And he is God not because they chose him. No, he's God because 
He chose them. They didn't choose him. He chose them. And as the Israelites were brought out of that pagan culture where where hundreds of gods were worshipped, God is declaring to them that he alone is God. And he is their God. And only he will be worshipped. Only he will be served. Now here's the question. Are we any different? Unfortunately, I don't think we are. I think we worship a bunch of gods. Oh, they may not have the name of Baal or Molech or any, any of those names of the Old Testament pagan gods. We worship other gods. Demons by any other name, but still we worship gods. We have other things we worship. And usually at the center of it all is us. Because we, it's all about our fulfillment, about our happiness, about our pleasure, doing the things we want to do regardless of what God's word says. And in this first commandment, he says, I am the Lord your God. Therefore, everything you do is about me. It reflects on me because you are my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of what? What were they? The house of what? Slavery. Let me, let, me just, let me just wrap up this point by saying this. The problem was slavery. The solution was God. I think what I need to make sure that we, we drive at this morning is that the problem is still slavery. You can't worship another God and be enslaved to him, not be enslaved to that God. And Jesus made it very clear, no man can serve two masters. If you've devoted yourself to something else that has become your God, that means God is not your God. And I love you, but you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. Because this is the question of your identity, my identity. It's a question of, of who we are in Christ. And by the way, if the problem is always slavery, then the solution is always going to be God. Last thing, God is the one who expects his children to remain steadfast to him. God is the one who expects his children to remain steadfast. Look at the, the actual commandment itself. We've just been working up to it. The commandment is verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. God is in a place where he's got to teach his kids first things first. The most important thing is this, and I'm just going to translate it my way. Kids, don't forget this. One God, I'm it. That's where he starts. And I want to share with you just very clearly that that God does this intentionally. The, the, The commandments are in an order. There is a progression to this. It starts with one God. Then it's no idols. Then it's don't take the Lord's name in vain. Right? Then it's then it's Sabbath, okay? The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The other five relate to how how we connect, relate, love each other. Remember, first four, love God supremely. God says how. The last six, love others sacrificially. Here's how. How does how does the how does that section of the commandments begin? Where do what's the first relationship any of us ever has in this earth? Mom, and um, well, let me just say this, just so we're clear, and dad. I am so sick and tired of fatherless homes. Sick and tired of it. Sick and tired of it. Don't worry, we're getting to commandment seven. We're going to get there. We're going to deal with it. We have to. Because how we relate to God is going to directly relate to how we, we connect with each other. We can't love God supremely and then love others any way we want to. And the opposite is also true. We need to go with God's plan because he calls, he expects us to remain steadfast to him. God is the one who sets us free. Why does God set us free? He sets us free so that we can live free. That's how I want you to read this commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. It's like a marriage. This is the illustration I, I want to kind of wrap up our time with here. It's like a marriage. Um, the way marriage is supposed to work, wanting, wanting to be clear, the way the marriage is because the culture says something different. Marriage, um, you have two people who love each other, love God, okay? They have a relationship with God, and, and their first call is to remain faithful and, and have fidelity with Him first. First. That's how it begins. The two people come together, they court. There's courting. And by the way, dating, not, don't like dating. We'll talk about that when we get to number seven. All this is going to come to number seven. Um, we, we court, okay? And by the way, dating ends. Courtship never ends. Guys, court your wives. Court your wives. Court your wives. Ladies, court your husbands. 
support them. We court one another, okay? But it's like a marriage. God says, okay, you're, you're my people, I'm your God. I'm going to be faithful to you. There's going to be a fidelity between me and you. And by the way, the expectation of the other spouse is what? That they're going to be faithful to them. That's the expectation, okay? God is, in essence, saying to, to the people of Israel, um, you're not going to hang with anybody else. You're not going to spend time with anybody else. There's, I'm your God. And Jesus, I mean, the, the New Testament affirms this. The church is the bride of Christ, right? Jesus is the bridegroom. This isn't, I'm not out of whack here. This is, this is solid biblical ground. God is saying, there is a faithfulness in this. If you worship other gods, you are cheating on Jesus. I think a lot of us, if we'll just get out of the theological realm, we'll get that. Because we understand what that is, don't we? Every person in the room gets it. If we worship other gods, whether they're actual gods, you know, demons, or whether they're just the stuff of life or yourself, you are cheating on Jesus. And Jesus will have none of it. You read further down, I'm a jealous God. Why is he a jealous God? Because he deserves and demands our faithfulness as a people. He deserves it, and he demands it. He demands nothing less. Now, a lot of us are going to answer the question. If I were to ask everybody in the room, who do you worship? Many of you are going to answer Jesus. But I want to, I want to draw a distinction here as we, as we close our time. There is a difference between your functional God and your actual God. You could say that you have an actual God while you are following a functional God. Okay? You say Jesus is your God, but you may be turning to other things. Now, I recognize that some of us, we may not know. What does that look like, Pastor? What are, what are you talking about? Well let's, well, let's deal with this. Let's ask some questions. I've got a slide up here that has a series of questions. How you answer these questions will, will determine you know, kind of where you are in your relationship with God. How faithful are you? Let's just kind of go over these. Um, guys, you got that slide? Let's put it up on the screen. I'll just start reading them off. Who or what are you living for? Simple question. What are you living for? Who are you living for? How you answer that question. Are you living for God? Are you living for Jesus? Or is there something else you're living for? Who or what can you not live without? For the rich young ruler, it was his bank account. Couldn't live without it. Wouldn't follow Jesus. In, in Luke 18. Who or what in your life can you not live without? Who or what do you turn to in times of grief or need? In times of need. Where do you go? What do you turn to? That may be the big one. When you're down, when you're hurting, where do you go? Some of us go to the fridge. <laughs> some of us are picking up the phone. Um, some of us are, some, some folks turn to a bottle. Some folks will turn to narcotics. Some folks will turn to a friend. Um, what do you turn to when, when you're low? Where, 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 where do you run to? What causes your highest joy and lowest grief? That's a big one. What in your life brings you the highest joy? What in your life brings you the lowest grief? What or who, or who or what is at the center of your life? How you answer those five questions will reveal to you your God. Seriously. If everybody answers Jesus in the room, but if Jesus is not the answer to all five of these, then we have, we have to deal with commandment one. We have to deal with it. Here's, here's the great news. We have a God that loves to set people free, don't we? He sets us free so that we can live free. God wants to be our only God, not to bind us, not to shackle us, but because that's what we were designed to do. That's what it means to live free. We have to walk with him. God does all the setting free, doesn't he? He does all of that. God leads us and then helps us in living free. But we have to walk with him in the freedom that he sets before us. Who is your God? I'm not asking if you pray to prayer. I'm, not asking, I'm, I'm asking you the question, what do you turn to in your life for joy, for happiness? Who are you going to in those moments where you have the highest highs, the lowest lows? What in your life can't you live without? Those questions will determine your God. Let me, let me, let me, let's, as we begin to move just toward an intentional time of response, I know it's Mother's Day and 
I know we need to get out and spend some time with families, but I think this is critical. Let me ask you the question, have you been set free? How do you know if you've been set free? Well, let me ask you this, do you, do you know Jesus? I'm not asking if you know about him, I'm asking if you know him. Have you given him your sin? Is he your Passover lamb? Is he your exodus? Is he your God? If not, then I want to tell you, then, then today is your day to give yourself to Jesus now, today. If you walked in here apart from him, living apart from him, you can walk out of here without him. But here's the thing. I, I suspect if you came in here living in slavery to, to, to the junk of your life, then, then you know you're in bondage. You know it. Can you be a slave and not know it? I don't think so. We're going to know it because we have a master. Here's what Jesus is telling us today. You have a master. It's not me. Let me be your master. Let me set you free. Let me set you free. You can walk out of here free today, turning aside from those things that are shackling you, chaining you to the life that you're living now. Because it's not okay. It's not. It's not okay to call yourself a Christian and live any way you want to. And let me just say this. Christians don't do that. We don't. What do Christians do? People who've been genuinely transformed by the grace of God, though we're going to mess up, though we're going to fail, though we're going we're to stumble and bumble all over the place, we have a desire in the core of our being to please him, to live his way. Maybe that's question six. Do you desire to live God's way or, or do you desire to live any way you want to? That may be another sign of maybe you're out of step in your relationship with God. Christian, let me, let me ask you, have you, you've been set free. Are you, are you living free? Are you living free? Or are you still living like you're still in Egypt? In fact, do you desire at times to go back to Egypt? The Israelites had that season. Remember how good it was in Egypt? At least we had food. At least we had water. It was better back there. They went through that. They're not different than us. Every time we pick up an old habit, every time we pick up a sin, that's exactly what we're doing. We're going right back to slavery. If you've been set free and you're not living free, then, then, then today is your day to, to have those chains broken. To answer the question, is God truly truly the only God that I'm serving? Is he the one God, the God of the universe? Is he your God? I'm not asking about yesterday, and I really don't care about tomorrow. Today, today is Jesus your God. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for, uh, God, just uh, the opportunity, to, Lord, to, to just unearth and, to, Lord, to unpack this first commandment. God, this is going to set the tone. God, for the rest of our series. And God, I pray, Lord, in this very moment, Lord, for those in the room, uh, God, who um, they're living and they're walking far apart from you. Uh, Lord, I pray for the one in the room. Maybe there's others. God, that they're still, they're still in their Egypt. They're still in bondage. They've not been set free. They've not given their lives and hearts to Jesus. Lord, you, you've not come into their lives because they look the same. They, they still look like slaves. God, would you do a work in their lives even this morning? God, that th there's nothing they're not willing to do to get right with you so that you are the Lord, their God. Lord, for those of us who walk with you, God, those of us who have been saved, God, we've been set free. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, God, that we would live free, that we would see these commandments, God, not as chains, but God, as those things that cut the chains. God, that you've created us to live for you, to serve you, to worship you, and God, you've created us that we would not only desire those things, but God, we would gain our greatest fulfillment from those things. God, I want to pray for the Christ follower in the room. God, who might be walking in open rebellion to your word. God, would you draw them back to you? God, would you remind them one more time, God, that they have been freed by the cross of Christ and they don't have to live the way they're living. 
God, as a church, God, I pray that we would be about this very first commandment. God, that we would be about, Lord, doing the work of ensuring each and every day we are affirming and encouraging that you are our God and that we will have no other gods before you, no matter how enticing or how tempting, God, those things might be. God, would you do a work in us? God, would you set us free? And God, would you cause us to live free? We pray these things in Jesus' name.